Thank you very much, Anne and uh, Sims Mann Center people for hosting tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the, um, like many ideas, new ideas in medicine, the concept of active surveillance for a cancer was considered heresy at one time, but I'm here to tell you why this approach is exactly the right thing for at least half of the men currently being diagnosed today with prostate cancer. <clears throat> for me, the story began right here with this tiny little spot of prostate cancer in a patient of mine. Uh, these spots are common, being found almost every day in other men undergoing prostate biopsy uh, uh, across the world, uh, usually because of an elevated PSA. But this one was different because this was in a 31-year-old. He'd had a flu-like syndrome that wouldn't go away. His frustrated doctor ordered every test uh, on, on the lab slip, one of which was a PSA, and it was elevated. Repeated, still elevated. His dad happens to be a doctor colleague of mine. We discussed this. What do we do with this? And he said, I've got to know if my son has prostate cancer. So a biopsy was done, and what do you know? There it was, a little spot of prostate cancer. I didn't know what to do with a 31-year-old with this. Uh, I sent him and his dad all over the United States getting second opinion from various experts. To make a long story short, he became my active surveillance patient number one, case number one. Uh, the interesting thing about this, it is now seven years since this was uh, found. He's perfectly healthy. His PSA, which had been elevated, is now back to normal. I don't know why it was elevated, and his last biopsy was negative. He has since gotten married and uh, wants to have children, all of which he'll be able to do, but he wouldn't have been able to had his prostate been removed for this little spot, which I'm not even sure deserves the term cancer. So the challenge I offer up to you tonight is uh, to appreciate, yes, there's an awful side to this prostate cancer, but there's another side too. So just to run the numbers, uh, prostate cancer is the second commonest cause of cancer death in men. Uh, the current year's estimate is 240,000 new cases, 28,000 deaths. But there's something interesting about these numbers, and that is the discrepancy between the number of deaths and the number of cases. So um, it is estimated that during a man's lifetime, he's got maybe a 50% chance of having a spot of prostate cancer uh, in his prostate, about a 16% chance of being diagnosed with it, but only about a 3% chance of dying from the disease. So this discrepancy gets people to thinking. This, not all of these cancers are terrible cancers. Uh, active surveillance is not doing nothing. Active surveillance is a, a strategy, a management strategy for uh, following men in a structured platform, uh, men with localized prostate cancer who uh, have what appears to be low-risk lesions and who choose to defer conventional treatment. It's not doing nothing. Why active surveillance? So there are three reasons why active surveillance makes sense. First is the benign nature of some cases of prostate cancer, like the one I've shown you. Second is the limited treatment benefit for many men with prostate cancer who have treatment but may not be benefited as much as we thought they, they would be. And the third is the potential adverse effects of treatment. Uh, these can be observed, uh, uh, can be deferred in, in many men. I'll show you this in a second. Uh, let me just address these three reasons why active surveillance makes sense uh, in order. Now, during the 90s, a very interesting study was performed by this pathologist in Detroit who got permission from the county coroner to take the prostate glands out of all men dying in the streets of Detroit of unrelated causes, car wrecks, gunshot wounds, heart attacks. And he, over two years, harvested 525 prostates. And he took them out and he sectioned them very carefully, uh, looked under the microscope, and what do you think he found? He found what's shown in this graph uh, chances of having prostate cancer on the vertical axis and age group by decades. These are stratified by African American and Caucasians, but you can see that with each ensuing decade of life, the chances of finding a little spot of prostate cancer uh, increase to where if you're in your 70s and 80s, 
you've got nearly an 80% chance of having a cancer in your prostate, a small cancer. But these are cancers that men are dying with rather than of. So, so the first reason active surveillance makes sense is because a lot of cancers can be documented not to uh, uh, bother people. Now, the other number two reason that active surveillance makes sense is that treatment, as much as we would like to think so, isn't always of great benefit. Uh, this is a study that you're going to read about on the front page of the New York Times in about two weeks. It was presented last year at the National Urology Meeting to a great uh, fanfare. Um, this is a study done in, in uh, veterans in VA hospitals across the United States who agreed to be randomized uh, to radical prostatectomy or observation alone, men with prostate cancer. Not all low risk either. And on the uh, vertical axis is the um, frequency of uh, death from prostate cancer, and on the horizontal axis are years after the randomization point here. And I think you can see it doesn't show too well, but red is the radical prostatectomy group, blue is the observation group, and you can see how close these lines are um, in these men out to about 15 years. The reduction in prostate mortality from radical prostatectomy was only about 3% over the men who were observed alone. Uh, this was a selected group of, of patients. It may not apply across the board, but for these men, uh, in the PIVOT trial, prostate intervention versus observation, there, uh, there was very little benefit of treatment. So we have to acknowledge this. This is going to be published in the New England Journal in approximately two weeks. Uh, the primary author of this study was Dr. Wilt from the University of Minnesota, but another author was my colleague, Dr. Aronson, who's on the faculty here at UCLA. So, so we have to keep this data in mind. And the third reason why active surveillance makes sense for many men is that treatment of prostate cancer, that is curative treatment of prostate cancer, uh, does have adverse consequences. Not, not as horrible as they once were, but in this study, another New England publication a few years ago, uh, uh, you can see looking at sexual function on the uh, top two graphs, both prostatectomy or radiation therapy, there is a decrement in sexual function. For urinary control, there's a decrement in urinary control. There is recovery, but, but I tell my patients that after treatment, their erections will not be as good as they were before treatment and that their control will take a time to come back. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I think uh, when it becomes an issue of saving a life, you're willing to take these adverse consequences, but if it's not a life-threatening situation, why bother? Uh, the conclusion of these authors was that therapy of prostate cancer caused changes in the quality of life. It's undeniable. The uh, primary author, Dr. Sanda from Harvard, but his co-author on this study is my chairman, Dr. Mark Litwin, uh, here at UCLA. So the UCLA Urology Department has been involved quite a bit in these progressive studies. The three reasons why, why prostate cancer, um, um, why active surveillance of prostate cancer uh, makes sense in many cases. So I, I'd like to analogize this to the voyage of Ulysses, if I can, for a minute. If you'll recall, his challenge was to sail his little ship through the Straits of Messina, where on the one side was a giant sea monster called Scylla, with seven heads, it could reach down and snap the sailors right off the ship. And on the other side was this water spout that could take the whole ship down called Charybdis. And our challenge today in separating the bad cancers from the good cancers is to uh, negotiate between the Scylla of lethal disease and the Charybdis of unnecessary treatment. And if you'll recall your mythology, uh, Ulysses had a beacon that helped guide him through the, uh, the straits, a beacon called Circe, a little sun. Uh, and we think imaging and targeted biopsy of prostate cancer uh, is going to be the answer. So prostate biopsy uh, is being done almost a million times a year in the United States. It's a very common occurrence. Probably everyone knows someone here who's had a prostate uh, a biopsy at one time. And the interesting thing about it is that it started out in a very primitive fashion. In 1989, the Stanford people proposed 
that you divide the prostate into six parts, sextants, and take a biopsy from each one of those sextants and you do it with ultrasound guidance and that's how you find prostate cancer. Very interesting way. Contrast this with the way all other cancers are diagnosed. Prostate cancer is the only major cancer that cannot be imaged within the organ of origin. Major challenge. And where the diagnosis is made by blind biopsy until now. Um, and, and my people at UCLA, my uh, colleagues who have been so helpful with this have, are helping us to see prostate cancer, target it, identify it, follow it, and uh, change this old uh, um, algorithm into a much more modern one. This all really started at Hopkins in about 1994 when the famous pathologist Jonathan Epstein looked at tumors that were being removed by uh, uh, Pat, with Dr. Pat Walsh and his group that, and showed that many of these tumors were being, being removed were so tiny they probably would never affect a man's life during his natural lifetime. And he proposed, based on his studies there, that low-grade tumors, that is Gleason score of six or less, with only a couple of biopsy cores positive and less than half of any core involved, like this little spot here, could be managed with active surveillance. And in fact, he coined the term insignificant prostate cancer, tumors lacking the biological potential to affect disease-specific mortality and morbidity within a given patient's life expectancy. Trouble is we find these little tiny tumors on these biopsies done, these sextant biopsies, because of the relationship between pro, uh, tumor volume and surface area. Uh, if, uh, a little tiny tumor, only 0.2 cc's in volume, if it were a perfect sphere, would have a 7, c, seven millimeter cross-sectional diameter, and we are hitting a lot of these. And so we end up with tumors being diagnosed by the pathologist that scare people that we're not sure what to do with. So. So let's uh, look at the bottom line of all this, which is if you watch these people and do active surveillance on people who have an Epstein tumor, a little tiny tumor, um, and you look at, and this is a study from Canada, uh, one of the active surveillance programs there, if you look at cause-specific survival on the vertical axis, over years of follow-up on the horizontal axis, large group of men, 450 men, you can see almost nobody dies in active surveillance. In fact, the 97% 97, 97 cause specific survival at 10 years. So although some of these men progressed and their tumors got bigger uh, and they were subjected to treatment, nobody dies. Um, the confirmatory biopsy turns out to be the most important of all the follow-up um, uh, treatments that are done here. Uh, our, our practice is when somebody comes to us with a diagnosis of one of these small tumors, then six months later, sometimes sooner to allay anxiety, uh, we uh, do a surveillance biopsy, our confirmatory biopsy, we call it. And in general, uh, the biopsies have shown in the past 40% of the patients have no prostate cancer identifiable on their confirmatory biopsy. 30% have continued low-risk prostate cancer, and 30% have high-risk prostate cancer go on to treatment. So can't emphasize enough the importance of that confirmatory biopsy, and if up front the man says to me I'm not willing to do it, then I tell him he's a poor candidate for active surveillance, and he should go on to definitive treatment. So what about pathologic outcomes in, in men who delay treatment and then for one reason or another need to have their prostate removed. Again, data from Johns Hopkins, 48 men who uh, had radical prostatectomy after being in active surveillance for an average of about 30 months. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting, the outcomes in these men were just the same as had they had their prostates removed right up front. Um, they were no worse off that reflects the slow growth of most prostate cancers. And it's interesting, too, that in all the men with large tumors, the location was in an unusual part of the prostate, the anterior part of the prostate. So, so the confirmatory biopsy and active surveillance is very important. We got interested in active surveillance here when we did some interesting math and determined 
that an estimated 500 men per month become candidates for active surveillance in Southern California alone. I won't take you through the math, but this is this holds up. And so in March of 2009, shortly after I uh, came back to UCLA, we started a formal program. Uh, we called it ASCAP, launched in March of 2009. Our enrollment into this program has been quite rewarding. Number of patients on the vertical axis and the year of enrollments on the um, horizontal axis are uh, this is six months into 2012. We are now at about 250 men who have signed an IRB approved consent form to be go into active enrollment, uh, active surveillance. When they sign the form, they give us permission to put them into a database so we don't lose track of them, very important, and um, to use their stored specimens for research purposes. Um, our our follow-up regimen, we do confirmatory biopsies in six months. And then periodically thereafter, we do a digital rectal exam and a PSA every six months. And we have been looking a lot at quality of life scores. Anne and her associates at Sims Man are helping us with this. Uh, it turns out that a lot of decision making by people in active surveillance programs is not based on science. It's based on anxiety. And we're trying to deal with that and to figure that, that out. So our progression rate uh, in the UCLA program has been about 17%, quite a bit lower than, than I showed you before, 30% nationwide. And we think the reason this is, is because with our targeted biopsy program, we are able to identify the men who need treatment and not put them in active surveillance and to, and to separate the men who do need active surveillance as a, as a priority more effectively than we could without the targeted biopsy. So our focus, as opposed to focusing on PSA or other biomarkers, is on prostate imaging. We're able to do this because we have a world-class uh, MRI set up at UCLA. Many, many of the uh, high highest level MRI machines are here. Uh, Dan Margolis is here. We have a MRI expert, a man who spent uh, eight years of his life reading prostate MRIs. Not everybody has a place like this. Um, just to show you what some of these MRIs can do for us. This is what we call the multi-parametric MRI. It has different components that make it more valuable than any one component. The notice on the T2 image, you can see a cancer spot right here. This is confirmed in this patient by what's called diffusion weighted imaging, it tells us uh, how densely packed the molecules are in that tissue, how suspicious it is by another uh, form of enhancement called dynamic contrast enhancement. And then when we look at the pathology, uh, we can see when the prostate is removed, that area corresponds very nicely to the areas identified on MRI. Remember I said at the beginning, it's the only cancer we can't see with, the, uh, with an imaging uh, 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 modality, but we are changing that with sophisticated MRI. This is a hard thing to do in a community setting, but it's something that a, a major university can do very well. Um, now, the MRI is not the end of the story because we have to be able to take that MRI and use it clinically to be able to apply it to where that biopsy needle goes and potentially where the treatment will uh, be directed. And we have a device here, uh, FDA approved in uh, late 2008, uh, which f helps us fuse, take the MRI images, bring them into the clinic, put them into the side of, a, uh, of an ultrasound machine, and, and, and the operator can then toggle a switch and see on ultrasound, on real-time ultrasound, what the MRI shows and how to target the device based on that. So uh, this is our Artemis device. Artemis was the Greek goddess of the hunt. Get it? The hunt. So we're, we want to try to find these tumors and, and deal with them appropriately. The uh, device has uh, three components to it. <clears throat> it has a tracking assembly here, which takes the ultrasound signal, brings it into this machine. It has a monitor that we work on because we uh, work on a 3D reconstruction, not on the ultrasound image. And it has uh, the guts of it, which is a digital video processor, the workstation, which digitizes the uh, ultrasound image and allows us to uh, work directly uh, on that, uh, on the MRI image, by bringing it to the patient's bedside. So 
Let me just give you one example of how this sophisticated imaging modality can help, uh, can help in these cases. This is a patient example who had a prior negative biopsy but a persistently elevated PSA. This turns out to be a common story uh, in the United States right now where PSA testing is so widely done. Um, this man's tumor was identified on MRI here. Uh, it's in the anterior part of the prostate away from where the needle goes in. So it, no wonder it was missed on a conventional biopsy. Dynamic cost mass enhancement confirmed that area to be suspicious. Dr. Margolis assigned it a grade five assignment, the highest level of suspicion. And here's an example of how uh, we do targeted biopsy using this 3D reconstruction of the, uh, of the prostate with the MRI component, the, the, the suspicious area uh, fused in, allowing us to put these biopsy cores, shown in yellow here, uh, directly into the uh, targeted area. And in this gent who had a negative biopsy previously, uh, there was lots of cancer that could be seen in this. This is obviously not a man for active surveillance. This is a man with a substantial amount of cancer who went on to have a radical prostatectomy. So we were able to spare him uh, uh, wasted time in an active surveillance program. Now, uh, we have made the transition, at least here we have, from 1989 when blind systematic biopsies were done to 2012 where targeted MRI guided biopsies are being done. And the reason we've been able to do this so successfully here is through the team that we put together in 2009. We've gotten some money from the NIH to help help with this, but this is not a one-man venture. This is totally a team effort. And just to mention some of these people, Jouti Wong, our pathologist who deals exclusively with uh, uh, genitourinary malignancies. We have a pathologist, a urologist, a biomedical engineer, Sham Natarajan, who's here in the audience tonight, got his PhD degree based on work he did on this project with image fusion. Uh, Malou McCarran, who's been with me for about 15 years as a research coordinator and Dan Margolis, uh, our uh, MRI expert. So, so anytime somebody comes here for a prostate biopsy, they don't get just get me, they get the whole team. And, uh, and uh, we think we are doing better than any one of us would, would do alone. Um, when we have a prostate cancer suspect, anybody with an elevated PSA or a new, one of the new gene tests, uh, we uh, then go ahead and do the multimodal 3T MRI, the multi-parametric MRI. Uh, the radiologist denotes areas of suspicion. The biomedical engineer fuses these onto a, a CD, bring it to the clinic, and then we do uh, the ultrasound. The, the uh, image fusion is done in the machine for us. Guided biopsies are done, and then we store these uh, images for future recall if necessary. We can actually go back to the same spot. If one of those biopsy cores is problematic, uh, we can actually go back to that same spot and take more samples in the future. So what kind of results do we have here from, from this project? Well, they're pretty interesting. We have, uh, in our first 171 men, we drew the line uh, last fall, uh, men who've had targeted prostate biopsy with MRI fusion, and this work has been uh, is in is about to be accepted for publication in the Journal of Urology. You can see as target image grade increases, that is as level of suspicion increases from no target identifiable up to a grade five lesion, the chances of diagnosing cancer with a targeted biopsy go as high as uh, 94 percent. Uh, so so. Uh, and notice the stair-step effect here. The green are the uh, all cancers, and the red are the really bad ones, the Gleason 7 and greater. Uh, so the stair-step effect is, is very meaningful. It shows that, that uh, our, our targeting based on degree of suspicion of images is pretty, pretty valid. Um, very importantly, of the men with uh, really bad cancers, 38% of them in this study were found only with targeted biopsy. The 1989 biopsies would have missed these men. And in many cases, uh, they did have negative biopsies when they went into this. So, so we opened enrollment in the active surveillance program here, second quarter of 09. Um, 242 men 
uh, this was as of uh, six weeks ago, had had uh, a biopsy at baseline, 198, let's see, where am I? 198, uh, had had a confirmatory biopsy, 120 uh, were out 18 months beyond that, and 59 were out uh, for uh, uh, 42 months or later. Our plan now is to do biopsies every two years uh, on these men subsequent to their last biopsy. Again, our rate of progression is about 17%, and it's too, really too early to say this, but no one has died in our program either or developed metastatic disease uh, under our watch. So there are some challenges to this concept of active surveillance. Physicians have established practice patterns and, and don't want to change for various reasons. There's a litigious environment and a fear of, uh, of being sued by missing prostate cancer. Doctors' incomes have been traditionally tied to performance of procedures. Radical prostatectomy is a beautiful, brilliant procedure as it's done now, and it does uh, pay us a, a substantial fee. So these are challenges that physicians have to get over. For patients, the anxiety component, I've mentioned that before, something we're dealing with. Uh, the word cancer is a very, very fearsome uh, cancer uh, word that, that drives uh, great fear into everyone. I, I, I can still remember a talk I had about two weeks ago with a couple, and it took an hour to explain active surveillance because of one of these little tiny spots, and they kept nodding their head, and they got it, and we walked to the desk to check out, and the lady said to me, now, just one minute, doctor. Are you telling me my husband has cancer and you're not going to do anything about it? So, so there is, there is a, a, a education gap that we've got to get over. That's why I'm happy to be here to speak to primarily a lay group about this. And in both groups, doctors and patients, there has been a fear of a lost opportunity for cure. But I've shown you that just is not the case. So... Our targeted biopsy program is really changing active surveillance. We didn't invent active surveillance. Active surveillance uh, began at Hopkins and in Toronto in the mid-90s. We were a little late to the game, but I think we're having an impact because our targeted biopsy program is allowing us to detect tumors that can't be found otherwise. It's helping us reveal the serious cancers. It's helping us to decrease the numbers of biopsies necessary to find out what's wrong with the guy. Uh, it's decreasing the confusion that surrounds PSA and other biomarkers, and it's helping us to reassure those with insignificant tumors that they belong in active surveillance. Now, before closing, I want to show you a very brief video made about what we're doing here, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Approximately 230,000 cases of prostate cancer will be diagnosed in the U.S. this year, but not every prostate cancer is deadly. Prostate cancer is so prevalent, um, many men during their lifetime will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And unlike a lot of other cancers, breast, lung, colon, there are some prostate cancers that just sit there. They don't kill you. So even though these are technically cancers, they're not lethal cancers. In most patients, we cannot tell the clinical outcome. Therefore, many patients receive surgery and we know that that's unnecessary. And our goal is really to change that. There is growing evidence that many prostate cancer patients can live without treatment, its risks and side effects, when closely monitored. The key is improving diagnosis and surveillance by improving the cancer biopsy. Diagnosis of prostate cancer depends on prostate biopsy. There's no other way to diagnose the disease. Amazingly, prostate cancer is being diagnosed today almost exactly the same way it was more than 25 years ago. Prostate biopsy is performed in a systematic manner, but in a blind manner. That is, we can't see the, uh, the tumors. Ultrasound is used to guide us to parts of the prostate, and we systematically sample the prostate but we can't see tumors with ultrasound. All that may change in the near future. The new technology begins with an MRI. I want to see is it um, a 
you know, a suspicious dark area. A highly trained radiologist locates and evaluates a suspicious area by using several criteria, including appearance of the prostate and surrounding tissue through detailed tissue contrast in three dimensions. Then we have other parameters we can look at with our new advanced techniques. And one of them is looking at cellular density or cellular packing. Obviously, this is a lower resolution image. However, you can see here that there's a very distinct dark area. We use a technique called diffusion weighted imaging, which uh, looks at uh, free water motion restriction. And so areas where the cells are more densely packed have more restriction of water motion. And those are the areas that may indicate a tumor. There is also the measurement of blood flow. Blood arrives earlier and exits or washes out faster in areas of tumor. The results of all these tests are then graded. Diffusion weighted imaging is given the most weighting, uh, followed by the um, the blood flow images and the T2 weighted images, and that gives us an overall level of suspicion. And that allows us to say, well, if one area looks like maybe a one or two, that's not really suspicious for tumor. That's probably old inflammation. Whereas if it looks like a four or, or a five, that's very suspicious for tumor, and that deserves to be biopsy. Now, for the first time, biomedical engineers at UCLA are taking these detailed images of the prostate and suspected tumor. We take the tissue contrast imaging, the T2 weighted imaging, because it has the highest spatial resolution, meaning it gives us the clearest image. And creating a three-dimensional replica that can be used as a roadmap to guide doctors directly to the suspected tumor for biopsy. My role is really to be the bridge between radiology and urology. What we're trying to do is bring the, th the 3D information into the urology suite. The image is fed from a CD into a device called the Artemis that allows the image to be fused with real-time ultrasound. The 3D processing software actually makes a virtual 3D model of the prostate and of the targets or the suspicious areas in the prostate. And that model is then transferred to the Artemis device, which combines that information with the ultrasound information to virtually map the target areas onto the ultrasound image so that when Dr. Marx is performing a biopsy, he knows exactly where the biopsy device will acquire the sample. Uh, this is a very impressive technology. We've never previously had the ability to actually see prostate cancer under real-time ultrasound. Did, did you catch that, the white that comes here? We have now got the ability to actually identify the area of concern and aim for it. We never had that before. So here's the target, and you can see how our biopsy cores go right through it. The technology not only allows doctors to target the suspicious area, but go back to the exact location to resample over time. And then the urologists can use this information to accurately biopsy the prostate cancer, and we can observe the cancer through time to determine if a cancer is growing fast or not so fast. To, then we can decide if a patient can be watched safely or if a patient needs surgery or radiation or other forms of radical treatment. We are uh, interested in trying to avoid surgery where surgery wouldn't be of benefit, where it wouldn't prolong life or ease pain. And many of these little prostate tumors that are being found today, uh, men will die with rather than of. So in conclusion, uh, let me say active surveillance is an excellent management strategy for low-risk prostate cancer. Nobody dies. Careful follow-up is mandatory if someone uh, uh, doesn't want to be followed uh, according to the rules and regulations. He's not a good candidate for active surveillance. Targeted prostate biopsy using advanced imaging technology is more accurate than blind systematic biopsy. And finally, targeted biopsy is improving patient selection for both surveillance and immediate curative therapy of prostate cancer. 
I have a lot of people to acknowledge. I'm not going to read this, uh, but uh, many of them are here tonight. And uh, just to acknowledge that this is a nice team effort. This is what universities should be doing, and I think we're doing this very effectively in this in this case. So we'll stop there, and if there are questions, we'll try to see what we can do. Thank you for having me.